At one time, the whole town took a lively interest in the hunger artist. From day to day of his fast, the excitement mounted. Everybody wanted to see him at least once a day. There were people who bought season tickets for the last few days and sat from morning till night in front of his small barred cage. Besides casual onlookers, there were also relays of permanent watchers, and it was their task to watch the hunger artist day and night, three of them at a time, in case he should have some secret recourse to nourishment. Nothing annoyed the artist more than such watchers. They made his fast seem unendurable. Sometimes he mastered his feebleness sufficiently to sing during their watch for as long as he could keep going, to show them how unjust their suspicions were. But that was of little use. They only wondered at his cleverness in being able to fill his mouth even while singing. Much more to his taste were the watchers who sat up close to the bars. He was quite happy at the prospect of spending a sleepless night with such watchers. He was ready to exchange jokes with them, to tell them stories out of his nomadic life, anything at all to keep them awake and to demonstrate to them again that he had no eatables in his cage and that he was fasting as not one of them could fast. No one could possibly watch the hunger artist continuously, day and night, and so no one could produce first-hand evidence that the fast had really been rigorous and continuous. Only the hunger artist himself could know that. He was therefore bound to be the sole, completely satisfied spectator of his own fast. Yet for other reasons, he was never satisfied. Perhaps it was dissatisfaction with himself that had worn him down. For he alone knew what no other initiate knew, how easy it was to fast. It was the easiest thing in the world. He made no secret of this, yet people did not believe him. On the 40th day, the flower-bedecked cage was opened Enthusiastic spectators filled the hall, and finally, two young ladies appeared, blissful at having been selected for the honor, to help the hunger artist down the few steps leading to the small table on which was spread a carefully chosen invalid repast. And at this very moment, the artist always turned stubborn. Why stop fasting at this particular moment, after 40 days of it? He had held out for a long time. Why stop now, when he was in his best fasting form? Why should he be cheated of the fame he would get for fasting longer? His public pretended to admire him so much. Why should it have so little patience with him? If he could endure fasting longer, why shouldn't the public endure it? Besides, he was tired. He was comfortable sitting in the straw. And now he was supposed to lift himself to his full height and go down to a meal, the very thought of which gave him a nausea that only the presence of the ladies kept him from betraying. And he looked up into the eyes of the ladies, who were apparently so friendly and in reality so cruel, and shook his head, which felt too heavy on its strengthless neck. Then came the food, a little of which the impresario managed to get between the artist's lips. After that, the spectators melted away, and no one had any cause to be dissatisfied with the proceedings. No one except the hunger artist himself, he only, as always. So he lived for many years, with small, regular intervals of recuperation, in visible glory, honored by the world, yet in spite of that, troubled in spirit, and all the more troubled, because no one would take his trouble seriously. And if some good-natured person, feeling sorry for him, tried to console him by pointing out that his melancholy was probably caused by fasting, it could happen that he reacted with an outburst of fury, and to the general alarm, began to shake the bars of his cage like a wild animal. Yet the impresario had a way of punishing these outbreaks which he rather enjoyed putting into operation. 
he would apologize publicly for the artist's behavior. Then, by natural transition, he went on to mention the artist's equally incomprehensible boast that he could fast for much longer than he was doing. He praised the high ambition, the goodwill, the great self-denial undoubtedly implicit in such a statement, and then quite simply countered it by bringing out photographs showing the artist on the 40th day of a fast lying in bed, almost dead from exhaustion. This perversion of the truth, familiar to the artist though it was, always unnerved him afresh and proved too much for him. What was the consequence of the premature ending of his fast was here presented as the cause of it. To fight against this lack of understanding was impossible. A few years later, when the witnesses of such scenes called them to mind, they often failed to understand themselves at all. For meanwhile, the aforementioned change in public interest had set in. So he took leave of the impresario and hired himself to a large circus. The hunger artist averred that he could fast as well as ever, which was entirely credible. He even alleged that if he were allowed to fast as he liked, he could astound the world by establishing a record never yet achieved. He might fast as much as he could, and he did so, but nothing could save him now. People passed him by. The little notice board telling the number of fast days achieved, which at first was changed carefully every day, had long stayed at the same figure, and so the artist simply fasted on and on, as he had once dreamed of doing. And it was no trouble to him, but no one counted the days. No one, not even the artist himself, knew what records he was already breaking, and his heart grew heavy. And when, once in a while, some leisurely passerby stopped, made merry over the old figure on the board, and spoke of swindling, that was, in its way, the stupidest lie ever invented by indifference and inborn malice. Since it was not the hunger artist who was cheating, he was working honestly, but the world was cheating him of his reward. Many more days went by. An overseer's eye fell on the cage one day, and he asked the attendants why this perfectly good cage should be left standing there unused with dirty straw inside it. Nobody knew until one man, helped out by the notice board, remembered about the hunger artist. They poked into the straw with sticks and found him in it. Are you still fasting? asked the overseer. When on earth do you mean to stop? Forgive me, everybody, whispered the hunger artist. Of course, said the overseer, and tapped his forehead with a finger to let the attendants know what state the man was in. We forgive you. I always wanted you to admire my fasting, said the hunger artist. We do admire it, said the overseer affably. But you shouldn't admire it, because I have to fast. I can't help it, because I couldn't find the food I liked. If I had found it, believe me, I should have made no fuss and stuffed myself like you or anyone else. These were his last words, but in his dimming eyes remained the firm but no longer proud persuasion that he was still continuing to fast. Well, clear this out now, said the overseer. Into the cage they put a young panther. Even the most insensitive felt it refreshing to see this wild creature leaping around the cage that had so long been dreary. The panther was all right. The food he liked was brought him without hesitation by the attendants. He seemed not even to miss his freedom. His noble body, furnished almost to the bursting point with all that it needed, seemed to carry freedom around with it too. And the joy of life streamed with such ardent passion from his throat that for the onlookers it was not easy to stand the shock of it. But they braced themselves, crowded around the cage, and did not want ever to move away. <laughs>